Namaskar and welcome to our special continued coverage on the US presidential elections 2024. I'm Mark Lynn. First, let's give you the headlines at this hour. The United States votes for the next president. The winner needs 270 electoral votes of the 538 electoral college votes to win. The Republican candidate Donald Trump casts his vote in Florida. He says that he's very confident of a win. The police also arrest a man attempting to enter the US Capitol with a flare gun. US stocks closed sharply higher on Tuesday after data signaled a solid economy, but the markets could remain volatile this week till the final US election results come in. And Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu fires the Defense Minister Yoav Gallant. Katz is appointed as the new Defense Minister. Well, let's get you the latest now on the U.S. presidential polls. First, as the race, you know, to the White House nears its finish. Well, voting for the 2024 U.S. presidential election is underway. The Vice President Kamala Harris and the former President Donald Trump are battling over seven swing states. They are Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Arizona, Georgia, Nevada, and North Carolina. Now, if Harris wins, she would make history by becoming the first woman, the first Asian American as well, and the first black woman to win the presidency. While a Trump victory, in fact, would also be historic because he'd join Grover Cleveland as the only president to serve non-consecutive terms. And the U.S. Uh, markets, they are up, which aligns with the historical trend of markets rallies on Election Day. So everything's looking good in the United States. Since the U.S. is divided into different time zones, the eastern part of the country is uh, polling first. Dixwell Notch, which is a small town in the state of New Hampshire, became the first place to uh, vote and where the ballots, in fact, were cast and counted. Tens of millions of voters across the United States have already cast their vo votes. They did so early. But these votes are sent either by mail or by you know, visiting the polling station in person and before the election day. But this is uh, the final opportunity now for Americans to vote in the slightly contested elections on the election day, which is the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November 2024, the presidential race between the Republican Donald Trump and the Democrat Kamala Harris. And the winner may not be known for days if the margins in the key states remain as slim as they are expected. And amid the ongoing voting, the American citizens They've expressed their views on the two candidates, highlighting the significance of voting in shaping the country's future. Now, some of the key issues in this election are border security, abortion, the illegal immigration issue. Uh, also, these are considerations that uh, are influencing the decisions at the ballot box. Let's uh, look at some of the reactions. I voted for Kamala, and I think it's especially important because just all the ridiculous and outrageous things that Trump are saying, and he's making, he's trying to make America a fascist state again. And as people of color and as a woman, I thought it's important that we have to vote this time. I vote for Trump, and I don't know not about politics, but I think he's good for the economy, so. But I don't know that much about the election because it's my first time voting, so. 
I want to vote for the candidate that has values, that backs his values, that backs it with fairness, that makes sure that in America, it doesn't matter if your name is Martin or Mohammed, Patrick or Patel, Singh or Smith, that you get not ahead on the color of your skin, but the content of your character. So the candidate who does that, and I, I know in my heart who that is. Abortion is really important to me. I think immigration laws are really important to me. Um, recessions and economics are really important to me. Um, and I think it impacts not only students, but everybody else. I think it's in God's hands and whoever's supposed to win is going to win and that's where I'm coming from. I just hope they do it right, you know. I'd rather they do it right than just rush through it. I'm here first thing in the morning. I think it's very important to uh, whatever you're doing today, uh, if you haven't voted, get out and vote. It's um, a right that not everybody in the world gets, so you have to take advantage of it and it does matter. It, it will change your life. Um, you never know what kind of legislation is going to happen. So, you know, take advantage of, uh, of your rights. It is so important that everyone comes out to vote today. It is an election like no other. And if you have any thoughts of not voting, today is the day to change your mind. You can do voting today, even if you're not um, registered to vote. And it will be an important part of our history as Americans that today you have gone and voted. And it's important whether you vote Democrat or Republican, it is an, a special thing to be able to vote for your candidate. Well, the Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump on Tuesday said that he would be prepared to concede defeat after Tuesday's vote if it's a fair election. If it's a fair election, I'm going to, I'd be the first one to acknowledge it. And I think it's, well, so far, I think it's been fair. I think there's been a lot of court cases. Both sides are lawyered up. Thousands of lawyers are involved, you know, thousands, can you imagine? And part of that is because we have too complicated a process. If we had a piece of paper, watermarked, you know that paper is more sophisticated now than computers. It's watermarked paper. You cannot, it's, it's, you cannot, it's unbelievable what happens with it. There's nothing you can do to cheat. Well, asked about fears of unrest after the election and whether he would call on supporters to avoid violence, he criticized the question and said that his supporters are not violent people. To tell them that, that there'll be no violence, of course there'll be no violence. My supporters are not violent people. I don't have to tell them that. And they, I certainly don't want any violence, but I certainly don't have to tell. These are great people. These are people that believe in no violence. Trump also raised concerns about the use of electronic voting machines. After casting his vote in Florida, Donald Trump reiterated his previous criticism of electronic voting machines, suggesting they were less secure than paper ballots and would delay the outcome being known. A thing like that should never happen. This election should be over. They spend all this money on machines. And frankly, if they'd use paper ballots, it would be over by 10 o'clock. And by the way, the paper ballots would cost 8%. It would be 8% of the cost. Uh, if they would use paper ballots, voter ID, uh, proof of citizenship, and one day voting, it would all be over by 10 o'clock in the evening. It's crazy. Well, even as uh, voting progresses, both Republicans and Democrats are confident of their victory. DD India correspondent Amrit Pal Singh judges their mood outside Trump's beach house at Mar a Lago. This is Donald Trump's beach house, Mar a Lago, at West Palm Beach in Florida. I'm right outside uh, Mar a Lago, which has become uh, the election headquarters of Donald Trump. From, it is from here Donald Trump is watching the election results. Uh, uh, to give you a sense of what the atmosphere here uh, right now is, there are people out on the streets outside Mar a Lago, understandably Republican supporters, people out here carrying uh, Trump banners, American flags, supporters, Republican supporters, you know, even as the voting goes on. And once the trends start coming in, in, uh, we would know how much how, how much have the Republicans uh, come out and voted uh, to talk about uh, you know how the Republicans are shaping up uh, here you're wearing a t-shirt saying women for Trump uh, do you think on the abortion issue what uh, stand Kamala Harris has taken cuts ice with the women of this country 
Um, I, I, I do. I think um, if you mean by cuts ice, like has divided this country, yes, I do. Um, I think it, it's, it shouldn't even be an issue anymore. We're in 2024. President Trump is for women's health, for women's safety, like keeping men out of women's sports. Um, he didn't take the right to an abortion away for rape victims, for incest victims, uh, women who might die if they carry the baby to term. All he did was overturn Roe Ro versus Wade and bring it from the federal government back to each individual state. And I don't know any state out of the 50 states in our country that tell people they may not have an abortion. They have to have the abortion within their term limits, whatever that may be. So I think Kamala Harris is pushing this woman's rights issue and the women just aren't researching it for themselves or they're just not, they're just listening to whatever. They don't even care. They're just hearing this and they're getting so upset and that's not what he has said. So clearly the opinion here in the United States is divided. Uh, once uh, the figures come in, we would know uh, how many women, how many young voters have voted uh, for uh, Kamala Harris or will it be Donald Trump who emerges as the winner from this race? With cameraman Sanjay Jena from outside the Mara Lago in West Palm Beach, this is Amrit Pal Singh for DD India. One of the US Capitol Police on Tuesday arrested a man at uh, the visitor center who uh, was carrying a torch and a flare gun. That's what the police said in a statement. The Capitol's visitor center was closed while authorities conducted this investigation. The U.S. Capitol Police had said so as well. Now, the arrest occurred as the voting is underway in the United States. Let's take a look now at uh, some more reactions that have come in from voters in Arizona as well as New York. I voted for Kamala, and I think it's especially important because just all the ridiculous outrage things that Trump are saying and he's making, he's trying to make America a fascist state again. And as people of color and as a woman, I thought it's important that we have to vote this time. I vote for Trump and I don't know not about politics, but I think he's good for the economy. So, but I don't know that much about the election because it's my first time voting. So. I want to vote for the candidate that has values, that backs his values, that backs it with fairness, that makes sure that in America, it doesn't matter if your name is Martin or Mohammed, Patrick or Patel, Singh or Smith, that you get not ahead on the color of your skin, but the content of your character. So the candidate who does that, and I, I know in my heart who that is. Abortion is really important to me. I think immigration laws are really important to me. Um, recessions and economics are really important to me. Um, and I think it impacts not only students, but everybody else. I think it's in God's hands and whoever's supposed to win is going to win and that's where I'm coming from. I just hope they do it right, you know. I'd rather they do it right than just rush through it. Well, DD India correspondent uh, Shubendu Ghosh is now live from Washington, D.C. with more. Shubendu, uh, you know, how willing are voters uh, to stand in queues for hours? Well, I'll, uh, I'd like to answer that question by showing you uh, where I am. Uh, I am at uh, the Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, Library here in Washington, D.C. Mark, and behind me, thanks to these glass walls, you can see uh, the long queues of voters who've uh, lined up since morning uh, to participate in the voting. Uh, they're able to, of course, uh, complete their electoral process and move ahead, and new people are joining in. Uh, these queues uh, symbolize the manner in which enthusiastic voters here in Washington, at least I can tell you, at all the polling stations that we've been to have been participating in the polling process quite reminiscent of the early voting as well early voting we saw upward of 80 million voters it's a historic number uh, participating in the uh, polling and here today on the big election day in washington dc all the polling booths that we've went to long queues not everything can be shot on camera we're not allowed inside but here uh, because it's visible from the outside we can see uh, the kind of queues that have uh, maintained their length through the day talking about uh, the kind of enthusiasm that voters are exhibiting. We spoke to some of them. They said that it's not an election that you can afford to sit on the fence. Whether you support Kamala Harris or you support Donald Trump, there are critical issues uh, related to uh, the nation, related to rights uh, of women in particular. And therefore, whatever your stand is, it is very important for people to come out and vote. So we see voters coming uh, with friends, with families in large sure. numbers and, and uh, exercising their ballot. 
Mind you, it's not just the uh, position of the U.S. president they're voting for. Uh, there are seats of Senate, House of Representatives. Uh, there are also local body leaders. There is an amendment on abortion in across uh, 10 states at least, uh, on which people are also uh, putting forth their views. So uh, it is uh, uh, an important uh, and tiring day for the voters as well. Some six-page long voting booklet they have to fill, uh, but they don't mind signing in the queue and doing their bit. We're also joined by Mr. Anang Mittal, who's a political analyst, uh, also based in Washington, D.C., uh, where Shubhendu is uh, right now. Mr. Mittal, uh, the District of Columbia is a blue district, has been so for the longest time. You know, with the Gen Z now growing up, uh, are we likely to see some change in the way people vote? Uh, not particularly. Uh, the District of Columbia uh, uh, went 93% uh, for uh, Biden in the last cycle, 2020, and it's historically always voted uh, Democratic. So that's not likely to change. There are some indicators that uh, Donald Trump may be winning the uh, the younger uh, vote, but uh, maybe not the Gen Z vote, maybe the 18 to 29 vote. But even that can be then bisected by saying there may be a gender difference in that as well. Um, for younger people, the concern is much more uh, social concerns than maybe economic concerns if they're in high school or college um, and they're our voting age. Um, and so those their concerns are going to be much more different than the concerns of uh, sort of working class or, or, or you know, older Americans. Um, uh, generally, it's, it's being seen that uh, women are going to be voting for Kamala Harris and in uh, uh, college educated women, that is, and uh, uh, non college educated males and women are generally, generally going to be voting for the Republican candidate. Um, and so it's going to be just interesting to see, but the patterns themselves have repeated uh, over the last couple of election cycles. And so what we're seeing in this election is uh, the, the closeness is much more. It's the tightest election I've ever seen in my in my lifetime. Last week, it was two to three percentage differences. Today, the percentage differences are less than one percent. And uh, people are saying it's going to be a, it's going to come down to the wire. Although there are some indications, some some analysts are saying that uh, we'll know about the results. Uh, immediately within uh, within uh, you know a couple hours of the polls closing, uh, and it won't be a repeat of 2020. But uh, again, nobody knows for certain. Uh, Shubhendu, uh, how incident free has the polling been so far? Well, it's been uh, very peaceful here in Washington, at least. Uh, uh, Mark, also given the circumstances, a few weeks ago there was an incident of uh, a ballot box being. Uh, set on fire. It's been rather peaceful, although we hear uh, the police siren, uh, the vehicle siren all the time. That's because uh, they are conducting, uh, uh, they're, they're making sure uh, in their rounds to ensure that the law and order situation is maintained. We also understand that the National Security Guards are also being put on alert to tackle any eventuality. The polling booths are, are very secure. Uh, there is a use of uh, bulletproof grass. Uh, we've also seen drones being used to monitor the situation. Uh, but thankfully, no untoward incident has been uh, reported, at least from Washington for now. Uh, but Mark, we also have to understand that the real, really critical period would be when uh, once the voting is over and uh, the counting begins, and because of the, uh, the time difference, the time zones uh, in which America is uh, divided, it will happen over a period of time uh, going from east to uh, west coast. That is when, when the first trends come in, when there is an indication as and when it comes about uh, which leader is going to come on top and who's going to lose. That is when uh, we are likely to see uh, passions flare uh, of the supporters. Okay. Uh, Mr. Mittal, uh, you know, how important is uh, voting day, uh, the, the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November, uh, traditionally? Uh, and also we've seen that, you know, last time around in 2020, there was a pandemic. So obviously, early voting, mail-in voting had some reason. I mean, people were obviously frightened to come out and vote. But that's not the case anymore, right? And, uh, and despite that, we've seen such a lot of, ma such a massive, oh, um, what, about uh, 70 million plus people have already cast their votes. And uh, a lot of Republicans too. Uh, is that, uh, you know, going to change the way this election is going to be seen? I mean, the results, I I think that's fair to say um, uh, Donald Trump in the last two election cycles, uh, he, he emphasized voting in person. He emphasized vote turnout, which is, not the typical Republican line. For Republicans, uh, early voting, mail-in voting has usually been the advantage in past elections with George Bush and John McCain. Um, that changed a little bit with uh, Donald Trump, but I think after the debacle of 2020, he changed his uh, views on that, and he said that, you know, vote early. As we like to joke here, uh, vote early, vote often, even though you only get to vote one time. Um, and so 
Um, I think that is going to play uh, a role in, uh, in that. Um, a lot of the early votes that are coming in, nobody knows the results for here, but uh, people are saying that a lot of the early votes that are coming in are going to be weighted towards the towards the Republicans, and then the um, the later votes, the what are called the absentee ballots, uh, may end up being uh, skewing things over to the Democrats, which is what happened in 2020 as, w as well. Um, but yeah, it's, it's very obvious that uh, turnout is high, and uh, it won't be as high as maybe other you know, 10, 20, 30 years ago, but it's definitely going to be a high turnout uh, election because I think uh, after the pandemic, people have learned some lessons. Uh, maybe people were shocked by some of the violence that happened post-election. And I think this time, uh, from what I'm hearing from folks who are, who are voting in different states and different areas, um, it's much more orderly. Even if there is a line, people aren't as uh, uh, polarized or negative about it than they were maybe in, in the pandemic era, where I think people kind of, um, you know, it was an opportunity to, to sort of vent your anger um, and that that may not be happening today, but again, we won't know the real uh, situation if things change drastically after the the results are in. Uh, maybe the next uh, the next week, you know. Mr. Mittal and uh, Shubendu, do stay with us. Uh, we'll uh, continue to get some updates, and then we'll turn to you for your reactions. You know, the 2024 U.S. election, which uh, went to the polls on Tuesday, it's going to the polls right now, is set to become the most expensive in history, with the total contributions reaching $15.9 billion. This is according to nonprofit uh, Open Secrets. Uh, the spending, which includes congressional contests, will surpass $15.1 billion spent in 2020 and more than double of the 2016's uh, $6.5 billion. In the hotly contested presidential race, Vice President uh, Kamala Harris has emerged as the fundraising leader. Her campaign directly raised over $1 billion, with 40% coming from small donors, plus an additional $586 million from supporting political action committees. Donald Trump's campaign raised $382 million directly with 28% uh, from small donors, where while affiliated committees, they contributed $694 million. The largest donor was Timothy Mellon, uh, the reclusive 82-year-old banking heir, who contributed $197 million to Trump and the Republican causes. Now, on uh, the other major Republican supporters included Richard and uh, Elizabeth Ulain, uh, from the packaging industry, the casino magnet Miriam Adelson, Tesla and SpaceX CEO Elon Musk, of course, and the hedge fund investor Kenneth Griffin, uh, each contributing over $100 million to Trump and the Republican causes. Now, as the U.S. undergoes one of its most consequential presidential elections, the former President Donald Trump, I beg your pardon, former President Barack Obama made an appeal on social media to vote for the Democratic nominee Kamala Harris and her running mate Tim Waltz. Folks, this election is going to be close. In some states, just a handful of votes in every precinct could decide the winner. So you need to get out there and vote. So tell your family, talk to your neighbors, make a plan, go to the polls with your friends and vote. Vote for Kamala Harris and Tim Waltz. Head to IWillVote.com to look up your polling place today. So let's turn once again to our guests. Uh, Mr. Mittal, uh, why is this the most consequential election that's being built? Uh, you know, I mean, Elon Musk for one says that democracy itself is on the ballot. Uh, why do you think that? I mean, what, do you, what are your views on the subject? Yeah, I think both sides are, are making this out to be a consequential election and, and saying things like democracy is on the ballot or democracy is in danger. I think that's a, that's a typical campaign rhetoric. I don't know if it's history will only tell whether this is going to be an actually consequential election. Obviously, you have these uh, novelty factors, which is the uh, either if Donald Trump wins, he will be the first uh, or the second uh, non-consecutive president to to run uh, to win two terms. Uh, the, the other one being Grover Cleveland in 1868. Uh, and if Kamala Harris wins, then she'll be the first female president, as well as the first female African-American and the first Indian origin president uh, of the United States. So that, that novelty aside, I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, the rhetoric from both sides has been very uh, charged. Um, and and uh, I think uh, post-2020, post-2016, uh, these charges that the democracy itself is in danger if the other side wins have become normalized. 
Um, and so the Republicans say that the Democrats are going to do things like, you know, shift the Supreme Court, expand it, uh, and destroy the Electoral College, which is the American style of uh, elections here, um, or, or do things like make D.C. into a state, which would give uh, two votes and extra votes in the Senate to the Democrats and give them a larger majority. Um, and so they're looking at these legislative and judicial changes, that structural changes that the Democrats would make as uh, anti-democratic and also these uh, calls for um, handling misinformation for putting people in jail. Maybe Hillary Clinton said that, that, she may, that people who are spreading misinformation should go to jail. And so Elon Musk and these uh, uh, Silicon Valley free speech advocates, people who are much more libertarian maybe, who are not a, uh, you know, as, as a democratic as some of the other uh, financial and business magnates are saying this is an assault on free speech and this is an assault on American values. And that's so, the, so the, from the Republican side, that's the attack. Um, and then for the Democrats, um, they look at things like the January 6th violence. They look mm -hmm. at Trump's rhetoric. Um, Trump also wants to jail his opponents. He says that from time to time um, and also says very, very charged negative things about immigrants and uh, says things about, uh, you know, foreign leaders and, and things like that, that uh, uh, and American leaders as well that they don't like. So they say that is anti-democratic rhetoric. That is uh, autocratic behavior. Um, there have been uh, lots of rumors that uh, Trump has maybe praised Hitler in the past. Again, right. the Trump campaign does not denies that. But uh, those are the kind of things, the rhetoric uh, of Trump and the negative negativity that he sort of spreads that they blame as being anti-democratic and uh, a danger to American, uh, the American system of democracy. In my opinion, in my analysis, I think this is just a normalization of uh, these charges. They were maybe, uh, you know, much more, uh, uh, they would stick back in the day uh, during the George Bush years or even uh, in previous elections. I think these days they're now just seen as uh, empty campaign rhetoric, both sides flinging that mud on each other. Um, and people are, are, are going to be voting much more on the uh, stronger issues of uh, the economy or uh, social issues like abortion uh, access and uh, women's issues than uh, any kind of democracy in danger uh, uh, issues. The, it's just uh, normalized campaign propaganda, in my opinion. Sure. Uh, Shubendu, uh, come in on that because you've been in, in the U.S. now for some time. And this uh, obviously this debate has been going on whether democracy is on the ballot. When we look at uh, why this uh, election is consequential, uh, I mean, from the Republican side, uh, they seem to believe, I mean, uh, some of their supporters, that uh, already the Democrats have a majority. Uh, they will win the popular vote for a reasonable period of time. And uh, they don't want this country to become a single party system. Uh, this is, I mean, some of the, I'm talking about the right wing uh, uh, YouTubers and things like that that I listen to. Uh, these are the kind of uh, remarks that are coming up. To what extent, you know, is the common man uh, affected by this? It's interesting, Mark, the manner in which uh, uh, the extremely polarizing election that we're witnessing here uh, is uh, also percolating down to the way uh, uh, people in general are thinking about these polls. Uh, we'll have to see that uh, on very critical issues, uh, the leaders have taken a uh, very opposing stance, whether it's uh, abortion, whether it's border issues, uh, uh, illegal immigration and other issues. Now, uh, we also see that this polarization gets complicated because uh, the voters, in fact, it's almost like uh, when you go to a mall to shop and there are lots of things that you have to buy, uh, one brand seems to offer you something, the other brands offer you something else. But in case of uh, uh, politics, you have to choose one brand and expect everything from them. Uh, so, uh, for example, in the issue of uh, abortion is concerned, Kamala Harris has uh, connected it with the idea of uh, women's empowerment, uh, women's right over their own body, and uh, for her, any vote uh, that is uh, given out in these elections is going to be uh, whether you support women's rights or not. Similarly, Donald Trump appealing to the voters that uh, each time you vote, if you think about what you think about, uh, whether the border should be left open as uh, Kamala Harris would have it, or uh, should we uh, close it and make America great again? So the very extreme choices that the people have been left with. Uh, but what is complicating the matter is that there are also other levels of voting that is happening. For example, uh, there is an amendment uh, on the issue of abortion that is taking place uh, across at least 10 states. Now, we've uh, spoken to some voters who said that uh, they support uh, the Republicans, they support Donald Trump, but not his stand on the issue of abortion. Mm -hmm. And therefore, uh, they're going to uh, be uh, voting uh, favorably on the abortion issue as far as the amendment is concerned, but perhaps the vote will still go to Donald Trump uh, largely. So we also see those uh, complications being induced in the electoral uh, process. But yes, the uh, polarizing impact of the leader's rhetoric has had uh, uh, voters really scrambling for uh, what they should vote for because 
uh, when they do, uh, there are lots of things uh, that become closed for them, given uh, the extreme uh, uh, polarizing impact of the rhetoric. Right. Uh, if we look at uh, some of the issues, uh, Mr. Mittal, uh, you did mention the economy. Uh, so to what extent, you know, I mean, uh, according to uh, the analysis that is available in the media, uh, the economy is one of the issues on which Trump scores. Uh, of course, abortion is one of the issues in which uh, 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 Kamala Harris wins by a huge margin. And their concern is that uh, the number of women coming out of vote, a majority of them will be voting based on this issue. So, I mean, she could win the election based on this issue itself uh, if all the women are voting in a particular direction. Uh, how, I mean, how would you view these two issues and uh, which one would you think is more important? Uh, well, I would say if we, if we go by the public polls of the American public, uh, economy is the bigger issue for, for most, most Americans, even the Democrat side. They would say that the economy is the bigger issue. Um, if you, the, uh, the, the public polling that has come out when people are asked, you know, uh, are you happy with the last four years compared to the previous four years? Um, most people have a certain nostalgia for the pre-COVID era when the economy was strong um, and there, there wasn't uh, conflicts around the world. And so that, that kind of nostalgia is playing a role here. Um, and we'll see whether that actually uh, propels Trump to the White House or not. Uh, but certainly in terms of the economy, um, you know, the Biden-Harris administration tried very hard to, uh, uh, to move the economy out of the COVID era and tried to do a lot of stimulus and, and green jobs and things like that. Um, and I, but I don't know if, if it had an effect. And most voters you ask today, they will say they are not satisfied with the economy. Most young people not satisfied with the economy. And so I think Trump is going to, to play the winning message there. Um, and I think even the jobs report that came out, uh, the jobs report was supposed to be good this summer. And then it was re revealed in uh, late October that the jobs, that America actually lost 100,000 jobs rather than gaining 100,000 jobs. So things like that are what, what are concerning voters, people out of job, the inflation, the, the, uh, uh, the cost of basic dinner table uh, goods uh, has, has risen. And so those, those are the issues where the Democrats just don't have no credibility. On the, on the abortion issue and on the, the female issues, uh, Trump has tried try to triangulate on that issue a lot. He has, uh, even though Roe v. We, we Wade was overturned in 2022, thanks to the judges that Trump appointed on the Supreme Court, um, he took the victory then, but uh, he has triangulated on it by saying that he, he's actually not for uh, an outright ban on abortion. He's, he is not going to support any kind of nationwide uh, bans on abortion or IVF. Um, and so the, those are issues that um, have blunted some of those attacks, but maybe uh, you have to understand, like I said, the, the college educated uh, women tend to vote Democrat, and so they are not going to believe uh, Trump's rhetoric, regardless of whether he, uh, he's for abortion or against it. Um, and so we're gonna, remains, remains to be seen whether the women who are coming out to vote um, um, in, en masse for Kamala Harris, whether on the abortion issue or on the fact that she is a, uh, a woman of color, she's gonna be the first female pre pre president of the United States, um, whether they're coming out to vote for her um, on, on those bases. Um, there, there is some indication that women will be coming out to vote en masse, but again, uh, the swing states, when the results are announced, we'll see if, if uh, Kamala Harris wins uh, the important swing states in the, uh, the Sunbelt, uh, Arizona, maybe Georgia, then that's an indication that she is actually going to win, win the vote very early on. Uh, but if that's not the case, if Arizona and Georgia end up being contested, Pennsylvania especially, then uh, it's, it's less likely that she's likely to win. And um, then we, we may not have to worry about uh, the, the demographic or the gender breakdown um, because it's going to be obvious that she's, she's losing there. Um, Trump can afford to lose uh, the Sun Belt. Um, Kamala Harris cannot afford to lose the Rust Belt, which is Wisconsin, Michigan, mm. uh, those, Minnesota, those kind of states. Uh, Shubhendu, when uh, are we likely to see results? Well, that's, uh, that's a million dollar question. Or may I say a billion dollar question given the amount of money that has been huh. uh, pumped into these elections, uh, uh, Mark? Uh, well, uh, I, I'll tell you what, what, what is going to follow from here on. We're in uh, Washington, D.C. as I speak. It's just uh, five minutes past uh, 5 p.m. in the evening. A couple of more hours, uh, the polling will go on. Between 6 to 8, uh, the polling would conclude uh, in the evening across all the states. But given the time difference, it would happen earlier in the east coast where Washington is, and then you uh, we move towards the west coast where uh, California is located. Uh, so the conclusion of the voting itself uh, will uh, take longer. Uh, after that, uh, the counting will begin. If it's postal ballots, the postal ballots will be taken to the counting center, uh, first uh, in the county center, and then the uh, counting will start if the voting has been done through electronic voting, which is uh, a small but significant percentage of voting here in America. 
uh, the data would be sent to the uh, county counting center. Uh, all of this data is going to be uh, put together and then uh, each county would inform uh, the state about uh, the results that is coming out in their uh, respective uh, counties. Now, we have to understand that unlike India, there is no central uh, national election uh, commission uh, that is there, so it is going to be handled by each state differently. So the speed at which the counting is done, speed at which each state declares uh, the winner in the electoral college sense, uh, one uh, winner, uh, that is going to uh, take uh, longer. Also, also postal ballots uh, that have been sent, they will also uh, take time to be counted. So our estimate is that uh, if the contest is very close, as it is uh, predicted, projected to be, uh, then it might take longer, it could take days before we know who's come out on top in this contest. But if there is a fair margin between the two candidates, if either of them is ahead of the other by a great significant margin, it's possible that uh, by past midnight, early morning tomorrow, US time, uh, we should be able to have an idea who's going to be the next president of the United States. Uh, Mr. Mittal, uh, to what extent has, uh, you know, the foreign policy affected uh, the elections? Or oh, they seem to be uh, rather driven by the domestic issues. Uh, after all, there are two wars in the world and uh, the rest of the world was looking at the United States as, uh, as uh, you know, taking a role in uh, conflict resolution, uh, using its uh, power as the sole superpower at the current time uh, to do that. And, uh, of course, with the policy that... Uh, uh, Donald Trump has, which is to make America great again. He doesn't really want, uh, you know, to interfere in international affairs too much. Uh, how does, uh, how is that affecting the voter? Yeah, this is a much less foreign policy driven election than in previous times, I would say. Um, much more based on, on domestic issues and uh, the personalities of the, the two candidates, uh, I would say. Um, I, think, uh, I think because there are no troops fighting abroad, uh, apart from you know special forces, American special forces involved in uh, secret operations here and there, um, or or um, involved in, in Israel in the Middle East and things like that, um, uh, there there aren't a very polarizing topics of foreign policy. That uh, there's a lot of money being sent by about. America. There's a lot of money being sent by America to uh, Ukraine and to Israel. That's right. That's right. So th those issues uh, are again the judgment of the the the, the public that has been polled so far has been that the Biden-Harris administration has not done a great job. We've seen foreign policy crises happen every year. Uh, 2021 was the disastrous Afghanistan pullout. Uh, 2022 was the Ukraine war. Um, and 2023, we had the Israel conflict, which has continued to this election. And we may still see um, uh, more issues with China and Taiwan pop up. There are some indications that if uh, if Harris wins, that uh, because Democrats are seen as being weaker on foreign policy, considering the last four years, that. China may actually make some moves towards blockading Taiwan in the South China Sea should Harris win. And so there are some indications that uh, there will, that foreign policy plays a role. But like I said, dinner table issues tend to dominate. But uh, in terms of foreign policy, if you look at Donald Trump, he is he has always uh, touted himself as, as somebody who has a great relationship with the world leaders, that uh, there were no wars, uh, there were no mm -hmm. conflicts, major conflicts during his time. He did not commit the United States to any kind of uh, conflict uh, uh, in, in, in his time. And so I think that is going to play a role in, uh, in how voters uh, vote on, on both candidates, um, whether they're happy with how the Biden-Harris administration has run the country, country's foreign policy in the last four years, or whether they trust somebody like Donald Trump, who, you know, while, while he did kill terrorist leaders, he did take on ISIS, he did take on North Korea and China, he, he made sure to not get involved in any kind of entangling um, conflicts that would uh, cost American lives, would cost American money. And then obviously from the Democrat side, they would say, well, you know, we're spending money in Ukraine, but we're not spending any, sending any troops there. And so we're actually doing a much better job of handling <clears throat> that foreign policy than, than right. Donald Trump has. Um, but, I, but I think uh, on, on the whole, I think Trump does make a much better case for uh, his foreign policy than the Biden-Harris administration has done on their right. side. Um, Harris has tried to triangulate on the Israel issue. She was seen as a much more anti-Israel candidate personality beforehand. Um, but then since the election has begun, she has tried to triangulate on that issue and has uh, even at the DNC, she gave a, a very pro-Israel speech and said that she will s support Israel's security needs. Um, and so there is there is some indication that the Democrats are going to try to be more bullish on the issue. Um, and just now there was an announcement that apparently the United States is going to do a nuclear missile test of some kind. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, it's obvious that, that Biden and, and Harris are trying to make sure that their foreign policy credentials um, 
are maintained uh, uh, and they, they look as strong on foreign policy as they can. A uh, final question to you, Mr. Mittal, before I let your, both of you go. Uh, it's, uh, you know, the stock markets are up, so obviously the better, the, those who are betting seem to be betting on, uh, I mean, wh who are they betting on? That's probably the question I need to ask you. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's difficult to say because uh, Wall Street tends to be much more uh, uh, bipartisan on that, on that issue, um, and many of the, the heavy financial giants tend to actually favor the Democrats, uh, the financial magnates there. It seems like this year, Silicon Valley is much more pro-Trump than it has been in the past, probably because they're seeing competition from China. Uh, and so that, that's another foreign policy component there that's playing, it's playing out that the, uh, there are certain billionaires who are supporting uh, Harris. Uh, because they don't, they don't appreciate Trump's rhetoric, they don't like how Trump operates, um, or they maybe have uh, personal differences with Trump, who himself is a famous New York businessman, and so they're, they're voting for Harris for those reasons, um, and the Silicon Valley types, uh, Elon Musk and uh, 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 mm -hmm. other, other people like him who are much more concerned about China, much more concerned about manufacturing and American, um, the American economy, um, and, and see a role for themselves, are, are voting for, uh, for, Kamala, uh, for Donald Trump. Um, and then you also have to look at Jeff Bezos, who has uh, who owns the Washington Post, who made sure that the pre the paper this time, for the first time in maybe 40 years, did not endorse a candidate uh, because he believes that um, uh, the news bias has gone too far. And yeah. so he decided he made this decision as the owner of the paper to not endorse any candidate. And so it's obvious that every business person is hedging their bets. They're making sure that whoever wins, that you know, they tend to have, uh, they want to make sure that they may have a good relationship with them. And so we'll, we'll see how Wall Street uh, reacts to the, to the results in real time. Um, when Donald Trump won the last time, there was some indication that maybe the stocks would go down. But then when it was clear that he had won, the stocks rallied very, very hard. And so uh, we're, we're most likely going to see a repeat of that if it's clear that Donald Trump is winning the election and is walking, is going to be the, the 47th president of the United States. We leave it there. Thank you very much, Mr. Anag Mittal, uh, political analyst joining us from Washington, D.C. And Shubain Dugosh, thanks for joining us for the moment from Washington, D.C. Now, moving on, well, the Democratic uh, vice presidential candidate, uh, the Minnesota governor, Tim Waltz, also expressed his confidence about the battleground state of Pennsylvania on Tuesday after making a campaign stop in Harrisburg. Now, he said that he and the vice president, Kamala Harris, they were excited about their chances in Pennsylvania. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, just came from the diner. Uh, going to board the plane and, and head to D.C. We're feeling great. I just want to remind folks, still got a plan to vote. A lot of time for these polls to be open. IWillVote.com if you need it. Um, and I think the choice couldn't be starker. We saw the closing arguments of one of hopefulness, unity, and a focus on the middle class. The other one of dark, divisive, focused on himself. So we're feeling good about this, America. Get out, get this vote done, and let's win this thing. Now we're excited about Pennsylvania. I think being here, we started it here. For me, it feels like closing the loop. We're excited about being here. We're taking that positive message. And you saw the energy in that room. Well, he's built towers, hosted reality TV shows. He's shaped, uh, reshaped uh, U.S. politics. And now he's back for round two. You can love him or hate him. Donald Trump has never been one to shy away from the spotlight. As the 2024 U.S. presidential election approaches, uh, its final hurdle or the final, you know, the line the crossing line, Donald Trump is once again making headlines. Uh, but who's the man behind this MAGA hat? Let's dive into this story. The United States. Thank you. Donald Trump, born on June 14, 1946 in Queens, New York, started his journey in a wealthy real estate family. Taking over his father's business in 1971, Trump renamed it the Trump Organization and built a global brand through a high-profile projects in real estate, hotels, casinos and golf courses. But he wasn't just a businessman. Trump knew how to market himself. His 1987 best-selling book, The Art of Deal, became a blueprint for his larger-than-life persona. And in 2004, he stepped into the reality TV world with Apprentice, gaining a whole new level of fame. 
In 2016, Trump turned his celebrity status into political power, clinching the Republican nomination and defeating Hillary Clinton to become the 45th president of the United States. His slogan, Make America Great Again, rallied millions of supporters and set the tone for his administration, which saw tax cuts, trade tariffs and a hard stance on immigration. His foreign policy reshaped the country's position globally. Moving the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem, brokering historic deals between Israel and the Arab nations, and Arab nations, and even holding direct talks with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. But his term was also defined by controversy. From a partial government shutdown in 2018 over his broader wall to two impeachments, the first over his dealings with Ukraine and second following the Capitol riot. Trump's time in office was anything but quiet. His handling of COVID-19 pandemic also sparked a lot of criticism. Now in 2024, Donald Trump is back hoping for another four years in White House. But with a track record filled with highs and lows, the question is, can he recapture the magic of 2016? Or will the past controversies weigh him down as he faces Kamala Harris in a highly anticipated showdown. And this time will only tell. With inputs from Nupur Praveen, Bureau Report, DD India. Well, from a trailblazing uh, career in law to her role as the first female vice president of the United States, Kamala Harris has never been one to back down. In fact, uh, she now contests for the highest office of the land. Let's take a closer look at the woman who can make history as the next president of the United States. Born on October 20, 1964 in Oakland, California, Kamala Harris grew up in a multicultural household with a strong sense of activism. Her mother, Shambhala Gopalan, an Indian-born breast cancer researcher, and her father, Donald Harris, a Jamaican-born economics professor, were both active in civil rights movement. From a young age, Harris was exposed to social justice issues that would shape her career. She attended Harvard University where she started political science and economics before earning a law degree at the University of California. She began her legal career as a deputy district attorney, focusing on prosecuting child sexual assault cases. In 2004, she made her first big political leap, becoming the district attorney of San Francisco, where she championed criminal justice reform. Her rise continued in 2010 when Harris became the attorney general of California, the first woman and the first black and South Asian American to hold the position. From tackling corporate exploitation to securing $20 billion settlement for homeowners. Harris proved she could handle high-stake challenges. By 2017, she was sworn into U.S. Senate, gaining national attention for her sharp questioning during Supreme Court nomination hearings. In 2021, Kamala Harris made her history as first woman and the first woman of color to serve as Vice President of the United States. Now in 2024, she is running for presidency after President Joe Biden stepped aside. But while Harris's record is filled with milestones, her path to White House has enough challenges. Critics point her handling of immigration and her relatively low profile as vice president, questioning whether she can unite the Democratic base. Nevertheless, Kamala Harris' journey from a civil rights rooted upbringing to becoming the vice president of the United States has been anything but ordinary. Now, as she takes her biggest political gamble yet, the world is watching to see if she can claim the top job. With inputs from Nupur Praveen, Bureau Report, DD India. Well, as uh, the race for the White House reaches the finish line, the promises are piling uh, high. In fact, tax cuts, uh, clean energy, conflict resolution and the battle for America's future. Who's offering the dream and who's delivering the reality? Let's dive in. In this moment, our country is at a crossroads. What kind of country do we want to live in? A country of chaos, fear and hate, 
or a country of freedom, compassion, and justice. Ahead of November 5 US presidential election, the candidates laid out bold promises to sway voters. This election is a choice between whether we will have a four, I think of this, four more years. I could, could you stand it? It's four more years of incompetence, and stupidity, and failure and disaster, or whether we will begin the four greatest years in the history of our country. Leading the Republican charge is former President Donald Trump, who has made Make America Great Again a central theme once again. Trump's key promises focus on reviving the U.S. economy. He has pledged to end the inflation nightmare, extend tax cuts enacted in 2017, which reduced taxes for most Americans and expand energy production. Trump has positioned himself as a staunch defender of Second Amendment, the constitutional right to bear arms. He also vows to tighten immigration policies, enhance border security, and reduce U.S. involvement in global conflicts. The Democrats' nominee, Vice President Kamala Harris, has placed emphasis on social reforms, housing, and health care. Harris has promised to accelerate the U.S. shift toward clean energy, building 3 million homes in next four years, and providing affordable health care for all Americans. She has promised bigger tax benefits for families but would offer the cost by raising corporate taxes. Harris has made preventing gun violence a key pledge. In terms of foreign policy, Harris pledged to take a more diplomatic approach to global conflicts focusing on multilateralism and climate diplomacy. These promises will not only shape the domestic policies of the US but also have significant global implications. But how does the voters see these promises remains to be seen. We have a report, DD India. And in some other news from around the world, Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu on Tuesday, he dismissed uh, the Defence Minister Yov Gallant over a breakdown in trust during the Gaza war against Hamas. The crisis of trust that was getting wider between myself and the Minister of Defence became public and this crisis does not allow the proper continuation of the management of the campaign. In light of this, I decided today to terminate the term of office of the Minister of Defence. In his stead, I decided to appoint Minister Israel Katz to the job. Well, in response, uh, Gallant said that working to ensure the country's Security would remain the mission of his life after Benjamin Netanyahu dismissed him. Israel Katz has been appointed as Israel's new defense minister. After his appointment, Katz has vowed to prioritize the return of Israel's hostages from Gaza and the destruction of Hamas and Hezbollah. And Gideon Saar uh, was in turn appointed to replace Katz as the foreign minister. More than 100,000 cars were damaged after last week's deadly floods in Spain, with over 60 dead. Paiporta is uh, one of the worst affected areas by the disaster that has killed at least 217 and left dozens missing in the country. Damaged houses and dozens of cars piled up on streets in Paiporta. Uh, public anger has also mounted over what locals decry as a slow and insufficient response by authorities which led to King Felipe and Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez being uh, pelted with mud during their visit on Sunday. India's External Affairs Minister Jay Shankar is in Australia on the first leg of a two-nation tour. He had an eventful day, uh, including engaging in a conversation with Justin Bassi at the inaugural session of the Rai Sena Down Under 2024. Here's the report. India's External Affairs Minister Dr. S. Jayashankar attended the inaugural session of Raisina Down Under, Australia edition of India's Raisina Dialogue in Canberra on Tuesday. Dr. S. Jayashankar is in Australia in the first leg of his two-nation tour. Jayashankar highlighted the remarkable growth in India-Australia partnership in recent years and India's efforts to force diverse partnership in a multipolar world. I would say probably the bilateral which has changed the most is Australia. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, one metric 
of uh, how a relationship is really uh, is, uh, okay, so how often did the PMs meet? And if you go beyond that, you look at uh, the quality of our defense cooperation today. Uh, the, the fact that we've been able to do the first phase of a free trade uh, agreement. Uh, the fact that Australian universities were the first universities to come and say, okay, we are prepared to explore a new Indian policy regarding uh, foreign educational uh, presence. External Affairs Minister also emphasized on India's active engagement in grouping like the Quad and BRICS. Quad has a certain Indo-Pacific context. Uh, again, the manner in which it grew, the, uh, the building blocks of Quad uh, were very different. Uh, in the case of BRICS, uh, it was really a coming together of uh, some large countries who, whose common uh, feature in many ways was that they were non-Western. Dr. S. Jashankar also met Australia's Deputy Prime Minister and Defence Minister Richard Mauls. They spoke about the strong moment in India-Australia's comprehensive strategic partnership. The minister also shared perspective on Indo-Pacific and regional developments. Earlier, Dr. Jay Shankar met his Australian counterpart, Penny Wong, for the 15th India-Australia Foreign Minister's Framework Dialogue in Canberra. Both the leaders also deliberated on respective neighbourhoods, Indo-Pacific, West Asia, Ukraine and the global strategic scenario. Bureau Report, DD India. Well, that's all we have in this edition of DD India News Hour. It's a special edition where we've been focusing on the U.S. presidential election. Now, for those of you on the go, you can get the latest news and updates from, D, from India and across the world on the DD India mobile app, which is available on both Android and iOS platforms by scanning the QR code. You can download it. We'll be back with more news as it breaks here on DD India. My name is Mark Lynn. From all of us here in Delhi, thank you very much for watching DD India News Hour, the special edition. Namaskar.